Welcome to the Rainy Day Podcast. I'm Isaac. And I'm Rhea. Today we're going to be exploring thematic development, character development, and plot development in the book The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon, a classic. Now, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. It was a very quick read. I basically read it in a week, except in the span of three weeks, but I could have read it in a week if I wanted to. Um... For a book written in 2003, I thought it really hit a lot of key points, a lot of really good themes that I was genuinely surprised with. But I would 100% recommend this book. It's very lighthearted, very fun, and the ending is cute. <laughs> okay, so just a quick plot overview of the novel. The novel begins um, in the year 1998 in the small town of Swindon, England, and it later progresses to London throughout the novel. Um, the 15-year-old narrator of the story's name is Christopher Boone, and um, he is on the spectrum, some form of autism or um, Asperger's. And one evening he finds, um, quite suddenly in the story, a dead dog in his neighbor's front lawn, um, his neighbor Mrs. Shear's dog, Wellington. And so this kind of sets him off on a quest to solve this mystery as to who killed the dog. He gets his little notebook and goes around the town and talks to different people about, you know, have you seen anything unusual? And this leads to his father eventually getting a little bit annoyed with him as he's causing a little bit of trouble in the town. And his father says, mind your own business. Uh, And that's an order. So eventually Christopher works his way around this command and when his father finds his notebook with all his clues and investigation notes um his father gets pretty mad um and he confiscates the book and hides it from christopher so as christopher is looking for this book he finds um in the shoe box in his father's room some letters and importantly to know christopher has been raised with the knowledge that his mother died when he was very young his father always told him that she went to a hospital with some kind of heart condition and she died um Unfortunately, this is not the case. As Christopher reads the letters, he finds that they're dated pretty recent dates, and they're dated to him explaining um, his mother, from his mother's perspective, her life in London, um, which is extremely interesting because Christopher thinks, you know, this is this doesn't make sense because I thought she was dead. So he actually finds out that she's not dead, and his father. Uh, has been lying to him this entire time, which obviously makes him extremely frightened and uh, destroys his trust with his father. So he runs away um, on a train to London to find his mo- his mother, um, who he's never seen before. So he gets to London, he finds his mother, who is with Mr. Shears, who is um, his father's neighbor, who she has run away with. Um, and after this, Christopher's father seeks him out, tries to get him to come back home, Obviously, he doesn't um, after the first try, and things are pretty messy. And eventually, Christopher does go back to his hometown, Swindon, to take his A-level maths course, because another big theme that we'll get to later in this book is math. And Christopher is uh, very good at math, even though he has some form of autism or Asperger's, as we've uh, previously stated. But he's extremely good at math, and he loves math. So he comes back to his town at the end of the novel to take his A-level maths course, and he passes it with flying colors. Um, And the end of the book, as Rhea said, is cute, per se, as um, Christopher gets a dog, uh, as his father tries to mend his relationships with his son, uh, and his mom actually comes back to Swindon and lives in a different house so that they can visit. So that's just a quick overview of the plot of the entire entire novel. So the first theme that we will be discussing is Christopher dealing with loss, deceit, and trust. From the beginning, Christopher was under the impression that his mother was dead, and he does get upset about that because he does miss his mother from time to time, thinking about all the memories that he had, Um, but then he later found out that she's actually alive. So that also leads to losing trust in Christopher's father because he, his dad lied to him the whole time that his mother was dead, but in fact, she was alive this whole time. So this makes Christopher run away to London to go find her because he doesn't trust his dad anymore. 
And also, Christopher has some struggles trusting strangers, um, especially in the middle of the book when he is traveling to London. He meets many people and doesn't like talking to them and gets very scared and nervous to be around them. So he likes to pull out his Swiss army knife at them from time to time. Yeah, it's just it's quirky 15 year old boy It's things. normal. It's, I mean, I, that's that's what I would do if I saw a stranger. Stranger yeah. danger, you know? Yeah. Um, one example of a quote, I guess, that comes from this would be on page 113. So this is this is right after Christopher finds out he's lost, um, that his, his mother is actually not dead and he's lost all trust in his father who has lied to him. Um, you can just get a sense of how even dealing with loss and deceit physically can be a thing for Christopher as he's dealing with his mental condition. Um, it says, quote, I rolled onto the bed and curled up in a ball. My stomach hurt. I don't know what happened then because there's a gap in my memory, like a bit of tape had been erased. And I had been sick because there was sick all over my bed and on my hands and arms and face. So you get a glimpse of just how emotionally impacting this is for Christopher and how overwhelming it is to his just his mind that his mother is still alive and that his father who's been so good to him and has raised him so well and dealt with um, his just mental condition so, so well and so kindly this entire time has just completely lied to him about his entire life. And by the end of the book, Christopher does slightly overcome not trusting his father. Um, his father did get him a dog, which is kind of ironic how in the beginning how Wellington, the dog, got murdered. Um, and then his, and then his father got him a dog again. But a quote on page 220 near the end of the book says, And father made a vegetable patch in the garden and I helped him. And we planted carrots and peas and spinach and I'm going to pick them and eat them when they're ready. So this just shows how Aww. even if it's just a little little bit hopeful that it could happen that um, his father and Christopher could become closer again. It's just the little things that help build that trust again between the relationship. So another theme that's explored in the novel is definitely using math, and especially using math to explain and navigate life. So throughout his journey to London and journey through uh, strangers and society and all this scary stuff for him, uh, Christopher has a constant struggle to keep his head on straight uh, while dealing with his mental condition. So he usually uses math to either calm himself down or he'll just talk about math. Um, Mark Haddon has a great way of using Chris's first person viewpoint of the entire story to be able to, we, it gives the reader a glimpse into his, his mental condition, how his brain actually works. And his brain is very logical, very scientific, very mathematical in the way it processes life. Um, a quote of him calming himself down. Um, this is as he's in the train station. Um, and obviously any public transit uh, zone can be very overwhelming at times. So, his quote, quote, I doubled twos in my head because it made me feel calmer. I got to 33,554,432, which is 2 to the 25th power, which is not very much because I've gotten to 2 to the 45th power before, but my brain wasn't working very well. So, obviously, you can see that Chris is extremely good at math, and he can just do these things in his head. It's like it's nothing for him, but it's kind of his way to calm himself down in those situations. An example of when he uses math to explain life, he talks about prime numbers in the very beginning of the book, um, and he says, prime numbers are what is left when you have taken all the patterns away. I think prime numbers are like life. They're very logical, but you can never work out the rules, even if you spent all your time thinking about them. Um... Another quirky fact, this whole book, all the chapters are in prime numbers. Continue. <laughs> yeah, so obviously using math is an integral part of this novel. And, and let's, let's go, go to, to the, the questions. questions zone. zone. Questions, questions, questions. Answers, answers, answers. Welcome to the question zone. I'm Isaac. And I'm Rhea. And today we're going to be talking about the novel The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. That's got to be a speed record on that title, let me tell you. Anyway, first question we have today is going to be, do you sympathize with Christopher's dad? And now to specify this question, we're asking 
whether we sympathize with Christopher's dad not telling Christopher that his mother was actually alive and keeping the letters from Christopher all this time. And all the backlash that he receives following um, this realization by Christopher that his father has lied to him. Mm-hmm. And, the, and, the, and the plot going forward from that. Yeah. So I feel like throughout the novel, like everything kind of seems unfair to Christopher's dad. Like, first off, his wife doesn't really do too great of a job with Christopher. Like, she doesn't really know what to do with him. Whereas Christopher's dad is extremely good at, you know, working through um, his mental condition and, and helping Christopher feel loved. And, you know, like, I think that this is a big mistake that Christopher's dad makes, obviously, is obviously, like, lying to someone about whether or not their mother is killed or not. But if you think about it, this is a really hard thing for someone to grasp, like, Christopher to grasp grasp this like christopher throughout the story is known to not really understand emotions um he really thinks in lot logistics science and mathematics he doesn't really deal with these kind of like unsettling like weird like not making no sense like emotions don't really make sense to him they're kind of this abstract thing um so christopher's dad and his explanation of why he didn't co- tell Chris this is that, you know, like, it, it was a hard thing to explain. This was an extremely difficult family situation that just ended up being messy. Like, it was almost like neighbors switching spouses is what it ended up being. Um, I honestly feel a little bit bad for Christopher's dad just because he's worked so hard to make sure Christopher is happy and healthy and making sure that he's emotionally stable throughout the day, asking about his day. Make, taking him to the zoo as to make up with all of the trauma that his dad caused Christopher. But um, especially near the end of the book where Christopher um, Christopher's dad is trying really, really hard to rekindle the relationship because he genuinely cares and loves Christopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a really good quote about this. So um, basically what happens is Chris's dad comes to find Christopher after he find after Chris goes to London and finds his mother. And there's this really sad quote. Um, just tells you how much his father really understands that he's really messed up with Christopher. Um, it's on page 197. And he's trying to talk to Christopher as he's laying in bed um, at night. Uh, he comes in late and he says, Hey, kid, come on, kiddo. Um, and then he held up his right hand and spread his fingers on the fan so that I could touch his fingers, but I didn't because I was frightened, and there were tears dripping off his face. So the only way, uh, just context, the only way which uh, Christopher really shows affection physically is by spreading out his fingers on someone else's uh, spread fingers. Um, so like almost like a slow, like awkward high five kind of thing. So. This is that's what it's talking about um, when he's spreading out his fingers into a fan, uh, Christopher's father that is. So yeah, obviously you can see here like there's deep emotion affecting um, Christopher's father. Like he's really feeling his effects of yeah, I really messed up and like it just like how how unfair this entire situation is to him is just I just I also agree like I do sympathize with his father like I think that's it's such a tough position to be in like it's really hard to do like there's no real like right or wrong thing to do it's just like you either get wrecked or you get like super wrecked like you can't really it's, it's just it's it's a tough situation either way yeah and i feel like christopher's dad has been so good to christopher and then he does one wrong thing and christopher just flips the switch and christopher thinks in uh, black and white so he either like loves someone or totally trusts them mm-hmm. or totally doesn't trust them at all yeah and by the end of the book christopher is actually in a gray area where he's mm-hmm. sort of talking to his dad sort of helping him sort of being around him more so that's that's christopher's way of rebuilding the relationship and just starting everything all over again. Yeah, it's again. a bit of a compromise that's new for him. So the yeah. next question leads in perfectly. Did you like the ending of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime? Yes, I actually did. Um, it wasn't a crazy plot twist or someone dies or anything, but I liked how Christopher Christopher's dad actually got Christopher a dog. Um, I thought that was a cute ending from the beginning and the end. And I also enjoyed how his mother comes back but doesn't live with Christopher and his dad, but 
she's still present in Christopher's life again. So it's I like thought, this massive gray area. Yeah. Like, it's like Christopher's in this new place where he's like, he did everything he could. Like there's a quote on the last page. It says, um, and I know I can do this because I went to London on my own and I, and because I solved the mystery of who killed Wellington and I found my mother and I was brave and I wrote a book and that means I can do anything. Now this is regarding to Christopher taking, um, Christopher receiving a first class honors degree and become a scientist because he thinks he can do that because he's, he's done all these things in this whole book that he never thought he could do. He overcame his social disabilities and his mental setbacks and just took it with him. Yeah, it's like the, it goes back to the, another major theme, which is overcoming self-deficiency, overcoming self-struggles. Uh, and it's just a really nice way to end the story that's not too crazy. Um, it's not like anyone dies or anything. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just a, a nice ending um, with the dog. And Christopher is just, he's, there's a lot of hope in this ending, a lot of uh, hope for the future and um, his, his future life. And like he, he, he truly believes he can do anything, which is, which is awesome because he does fear a lot of things throughout the novel. Um, and now here he seems to be this, this fearless, um, fearless soul reaching into the unknown. It's a deep quote. It's dramatic. Dramatic, very dramatic. Thank you, Raindrops, for listening to our podcast. I know there's thousands and millions of podcasts out there. And you came and listened to ours. I mean, it's the best one, let's be honest. You're right. Join us next week. We're going to be tackling the first two volumes of Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time. And... It's only a few thousand pages, so just just get reading. And we'll see you next time.